you're listening to FBC Radio on 16.9. Church and community, welcome to FBC Radio. Today is April the 12th, 2020, but more importantly, it is Easter Sunday. So happy Resurrection Day! This is a very unusual Easter Sunday, isn't it? Normally some churches would have had an early sunrise service this morning and some of them would have planned to have a baptismal service at some point during the day. For us at Frimley Baptist Church, today we would have been gathering for an all-age family service and the atmosphere would have been one of great joy and celebration as we had talked about the resurrection of Jesus in hopefully a very creative way. But instead... Everything has changed. An event that we would normally celebrate together in one place, we are today celebrating at a distance in lots of places. Our normal Easter routines have melted away like chocolate eggs in the sun. Maybe we'd plan to meet up with some of the family this Easter. Maybe we've even bought some chocolate Easter eggs to give out to our family members who live far away, but we can't now get them to them. That's certainly the case in our home. We've got four large Easter eggs sitting in our front room, ready to be sent out to the younger members of our family. But we weren't able to get those eggs to them in time for Easter. 
and they have to be eaten by July. Now it is remotely possible that we could still be in lockdown in July. So my wife Elaine and I now have to make this really difficult decision and may have to reluctantly and sacrificially eat those chocolate eggs instead of passing them on. Everything has changed this year, but that could be a good thing. Now I'm not suggesting that the virus is a good thing, but I am suggesting the fact that everything has changed this year that that might be a good thing. You see, we celebrate Easter every year, and perhaps we've created our own routines and ways of doing it. And perhaps in many ways we can simply end up just following our usual format every year. And as a result, we can miss something of the joy of Easter and the vibrancy and the wonder and the uniqueness and the change that the resurrection brought to the world on that first resurrection day that we actually celebrate today. So maybe the fact that we are not celebrating Easter in our usual way, in our usual place, and maybe with the usual people, then this is a great opportunity for us to experience Easter in a different way this year than we normally would do. And as a result, we may look back on this Easter positively in the future rather than negatively. So to encourage that idea, just take a few moments to try and identify two things about this Easter that makes it better than previous ones. If you're with others, have a chat with them. If you're on your own, ponder the question yourself. What silver lining can you identify within this current cloud? I'll give you a minute or so to think about it. I think one of the positive things that we can learn from our current negative experience is that we are finding out what it feels like to be isolated from others or from our normal way of living, which I think is helping us to identify more with those who experience isolation every day and not just when we're in lockdown. And I think it will be good for us to remember how we are currently feeling. Let's remember the emotions. Let's remember the frustrations. Maybe even remember the anger that we're feeling. And then remember that what is a temporary experience for us is the permanent way of life for many because of illness, infirmity, aging bodies, or because of being culturally disconnected from the local community. This is their life. Maybe this is your life. And we would do well when this is all over and we've returned back to our normal way of life to let this sense of isolation that we are now experiencing motivate us to become more caring and considerate towards those around us for whom this sense of isolation will continue. So what can we do as a church and community? What should we do? What will we do? Let's pray. Lord, on this day when we celebrate your resurrection from the dead, bringing hope to the world that death is no longer the end, but those who put their trust in you may receive eternal life with you forever and experience abundant life on earth now. Lord, I pray that we may be perpetual students, always learning from you, always learning about you, and always learning how we can be the conduit of your love 
to those around us. Lord, we ask you to speak to us today through the songs that are sung, through the prayers that we pray, through the words that are spoken. And then help us to be your hands and feet this week in whatever way we can be to be of an encouragement to one another. And I ask this in Jesus name. Amen. Katie's got a short Easter message for the children and for those who are young at heart. So I'm going to hand over to her at this point. Happy Easter, everyone. Now, this morning I'm going to tell you a story and I'm afraid we can't have all the drama that maybe would go with it. But hopefully it will still come alive for you. It was very early. The birds were only just waking up and the sun had yet to open its bright eyes on the world. The sky was grey and grainy and the air was cold. Three women walked slowly towards the graveyard. Jesus was buried there and the women were coming to visit his grave. They talked in sad whispers, they cried, they held each other's hands. Jesus had been dead for three days and they missed him very much. But just as they reached the graveyard, however, something surprising happened. The ground began to shake. The air began to rumble and quick as lightning, an angel flashed down from heaven and rolled the stone door away. Everything went quiet. The ground stopped moving, but the woman shook with fear. Don't be afraid, the angel said. Come and see. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Arm in arm, the women crept past the angel and into the tomb. The sheets were still there, the sheets that had wrapped his body. But Jesus himself was gone. Where is he? asked the woman. What have they done with him? I told you, smiled the angel, he's not dead anymore. He's come back to life and he wants you to tell all his friends. The women looked at each other. They didn't know whether to laugh or cry. They could hardly believe it. That is, until they hurried out the tomb and ran into Jesus. Oh, Jesus, they cried. It's true. You are alive. And they fell at his feet amazed. There's no need to be afraid anymore, he said. God has made everything all right, but I have a job for you. I want you to tell the rest of my friends that I am alive. Tell them I will meet them on the seashore in Galilee, where all our adventures started. This is a really, really special story for us. And what I've always wondered is what the women were thinking the morning they went to the tomb. Extreme sadness, heartbreak over losing just not a friend or a father figure, but someone you thought had the power to change the world. But what we know is what they expected to find on that morning was not what they did. Sometimes what we expect to find in our lives is not what happens. Now, another way of putting this is like an egg. If I take an egg from a packet and throw it down, what will happen? It will smash and make a mess. If you turn your eyes to the screen, you can see what happened. Sure enough, it smashes, revealing egg white and yolk mixed in with the shell. Now, if I take a second egg from the box and do it again, will the same thing happen? Looking at the screen again, yes, it does. Now, if I keep repeating this, we would definitely think that this was normal and what we should expect. Now, if I take another egg from the packet, what we believe would happen would be the same, right? Watch and listen again. It smashed, but nothing was inside. Just broken remains of a shell, but nothing inside. That sound a little bit familiar to the story we just had? Sometimes what we expect isn't what happened. And amazingly, that was the case on Easter Sunday. There is a reason your chocolate eggs have nothing inside, just like my egg that represents the tomb that Jesus lay in and how we can find it empty because Jesus was risen. So, as you tuck into your chocolate eggs, which I will hope you will do, please remember that the egg and the tomb are empty for a reason. And this is a reason to celebrate that Jesus is alive. Thank you, Katie. The Carlisles are now going to lead us in the singing of a classic Easter hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. And you are invited to sing along with the loudest and happiest voices that you can find within you. And maybe you would also like to stand up as we sing.
Sylvia is going to now lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we rejoice today at the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and give you all the glory for sending your Son to die for us and take away the sin of the world. Today we see our beautiful world in lockdown, but we know you're all seeing, all knowing God and in control. Nothing surprises you or is too difficult for you to handle. Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love to all who love him and keep his commandments, we confess to our mighty God we have sinned and done wrong in your sight. If you take a moment to come before the Lord. Jesus, we thank you for your selfless sacrifice for us that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. We bring our world into your hands as we see so many losing their lives through the virus. We pray for your comfort to all who have lost loved ones, either through the virus or natural causes. We think particularly at this time with Sally and the boys. We pray for all who are fearful and alone. We bring before you families who are at home and educating their children, for the poor who need food and for all those helping to support them and freely giving all they can at this time of lockdown. We pray for couples who are isolating and never been in this position before to mend or repair or damaged relationships and to be grateful for each other. We pray for those in danger of abusive partners and pray, Lord, the helpline will give them the guidance they need to keep them safe. We pray for the teachers who are looking after our children with special needs and frontline workers, that you would keep them all safe. You are much bigger than we can imagine and have the power and grace to comfort all who need your loving touch. We pray for all the volunteers that have come forward to help vulnerable people. Please, Lord, keep them all safe. For the men and women working hard to keep our country moving. May the authorities provide the correct protective equipment, Lord, to keep them all safe. We thank you for all the people inventing and producing life-saving equipment and the togetherness of our country once again. We thank you for our marvellous National Health Service and intensive care units. Please let there be the correct equipment to keep them all safe. We pray for the governments of the world and ask that you give them your wisdom. For Lord, they need your wisdom to overcome this epidemic, which is so hard for any human to manage. We bring before you the third world countries, when they do not have the means to beat this virus and ask for your solution to be found soon. We thank you for the government of the UK and pray you will unite them in these uncertain and changing times ahead. We pray for Boris Johnson and ask for his complete healing and salvation. We think and pray for his families and for all the families whose loved ones are fighting this virus. But also we thank you, Lord, for all who have recovered. 
we thank you for Queen Elizabeth and her resolute spirit and Lord the message she gave to the Commonwealth to keep our spirits high and to bring hope of better days ahead. Keep her safe, we pray. Thank you for Prince Charles's recovery and we ask, Lord, you keep all her family safe. We thank you for Pastor Glenn and the ministry team and ask you give them the wisdom in the coming weeks as to how to handle this time. We thank you for the great team in our church who are helping those in need. We pray for our family members who do not know you yet and pray for their salvation as we bring them before you in prayer. We thank you for the modern technology we have. We pray people will hear the message of salvation and many will come to know your loving kindness, grace and mercy. For Lord, we know your word never fails. And Lord, as we look to the Psalms, we look, Lord, with great anticipation that you are a loving God and that you care about every part of us. And I think, Lord, of Psalm 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Holy Father, accept our heartfelt prayers in the name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. And now it's time for Family News. Today is the fourth Sunday where we haven't been able to gather together. So it is possible that we're starting to forget what the church family looks like. So to help us to remember, here are a few photographs sent in from members of the congregation wishing us a very happy Resurrection Day. Thank you to all those who sent those pictures in. Don't forget this week, Spring Harvest are running a series of online meetings over YouTube. Just go to youtube.com and type in Spring Harvest Home and you'll be able to listen to everything they're producing absolutely free. And finally, a reminder that in next week's stream service, we will be running an online communion. So if you're tuning in, then you might like to have with you a small glass of wine or juice and some bread, and then we can share in communion together. And that brings us to the end of... Family News! Joe is now going to bring our Bible reading for today. John chapter 20, verses 1 to 23. Early on the first day of the week... Whilst it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running 
but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Madeline went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Well, that was very interesting. In that reading, there was no mention of chocolate eggs or egg hunts. There was no mention of the Easter bunny or Easter cards or Easter bonnets. In fact, the word Easter itself wasn't even mentioned. And that's because none of these things were in place when the original Easter story took place. They were all added later as a way to celebrate Easter. But ironically, nowadays, when millions of people celebrate Easter, it's all these additional things that become the central focus of their celebration. And the original story is either omitted or actually not known. Now, I'm not opposed to the idea of all of these add-ons. When I look at my TV contract or I look at my mobile phone contract, there are often add-ons that I can subscribe to that can help me make my contract of even greater and wider appeal to me. And when it comes to celebrating Easter, I don't have any hang-ups with the idea of including dressing up and eating chocolate and generally having fun together with friends. I do, however, think that it's relevant that the original event that the Festival of Easter commemorates should be known and understood and ideally personally applied. As I said earlier, This is a very different Easter than we've ever had before. And therefore, perhaps we could find ourselves connecting with the story in a different way than we normally would. I think it's interesting that in this reading, Jesus appears to an individual and then appears to a group of people. 
And I guess that sums up how we are currently meeting and maybe listening to this broadcast. Some of us are on our own, and some of us are with others. The fact that Jesus on that first resurrection day met with both types, I think is a good reminder that today on this resurrection day, wherever we are, and whether we are alone or with others, the risen Jesus is with us. In the reading today, we are introduced to a woman called Mary Magdalene. And I think it's worth saying at the start that the teaching of some branches of the Christian church that say that Mary was a prostitute is not backed up by the Bible. What the Bible does say is that she had been a follower of Jesus ever since he had cast seven demons out of her. She had seen Jesus die on the cross and she had watched him being buried in a tomb. And now on Easter Sunday, she had come to the tomb very early in the morning while it was still dark. The other Gospels say that a few women came to the tomb early that morning to anoint Jesus' body. But this event in John chapter 20 probably occurred before the other women arrived. Mary had perhaps gone ahead of them to pay her respects. When she arrived at the tomb, she saw that the stone that had been placed in front of it had been rolled away. So she was being confronted with the amazing news that Jesus was no longer in the tomb and had in fact risen from the dead. But she didn't see it that way. Although she may have heard Jesus on occasion speak of the fact that he was going to rise again from the dead after three days, it would appear that that was not in her mind as she stood in the darkness looking at the empty tomb. Despite the fact that she was looking at evidence of the resurrection... That could have caused her to write the song that the Rowitz started the broadcast with this morning about the greatest day in history. Jesus is alive. Instead, she interpreted what she saw differently. As she looked at the stone that was rolled away from the tomb, she concluded not that Jesus had risen from the dead, but rather that someone had entered the tomb and stolen the body of Jesus. Now, her conclusion was not unreasonable based on what she was looking at, but it was inaccurate. And the same thing can happen today when people consider the empty tomb. Some might say, well, the disciples stole the body and pretended that Jesus had risen from the dead. But would they really have kept such a hoax going when their lives were put on the line? Would they and those who followed them really be willing to give their lives for Jesus as hundreds and thousands have done so over the years if the whole thing was really fake news? Some might suggest that they simply went to the wrong tomb. But all four Gospels are very clear that Mary and the other women had watched Jesus' body being placed into that particular tomb. And Mary's love for Jesus would have made sure that she would not forget where his body had been placed. Some might suggest that Jesus never really died, but that he fainted on the cross and then revived a couple of days later in the cool air of the tomb. He then pushed the stone away and presented himself as being risen from the dead. But when you consider the amount of physical abuse that Jesus had endured, the whipping and the beating of his body, being deprived of sleep, a crown of thorns being embedded in his head, having to carry a heavy cross which he ended up needing help with, having nails pierce his wrists, nails pierce his feet, plus the fact that John's Gospel tells us that Jesus was pronounced dead by the soldiers when a soldier had pierced his side with a spear and blood and water had come out, which they knew as professional executioners was evidence that his lungs had collapsed and that he had indeed died. A number of years ago, a journalist by the name of Lee Strobel set out to examine these claims and other claims in order to disprove the resurrection. And he wrote a book about his journey and a film was made about it too. And if you have access to Amazon Prime Video, you might like to watch that film. Just search for the film Case for Christ and you can watch what happened to him. Lots of people can look at the same scenario of the empty tomb and come up with different interpretations of what they see. 
but the Bible's account and the personal faith of millions of people all around the world all bear witness to the fact that the tomb was empty because Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. Mary, however, on that first resurrection morning, saw the empty tomb through eyes that were full of tears. Not only did she feel the pain of having seen Jesus die, but now she was experiencing the added anguish because she thought someone had stolen the body. As she stood staring at the empty tomb, she should have been filled with an emotion of joy because Jesus was alive. But instead, she was filled with the emotion of grief. Although she was looking at the evidence for the resurrection, all she could see was desecration. But into this environment of deep sadness, we are introduced to the fact that the risen Jesus is right there with her. She just doesn't know it. In all of her grief and confusion and misunderstanding and wrong interpretation of what's happening, Jesus is standing right there with her. She just can't see him because her eyes are on something else and her mind is full of confusion. Many of us may feel a bit like Mary as we watch the television and listen to the awful news of how coronavirus is causing so much suffering and heartache around the world. Maybe like Mary, we feel like we're standing in a graveyard, looking into a very dark place. A place where there is death all around us. And as a result, inevitably, many of us will identify with the emotion that Mary was feeling. A sense of horror, a sense of disbelief, an overwhelming sense of grief. And if that is the case, then we need to also become aware that just as was the case for Mary, so it is for us that the presence of Jesus is right behind us. And when someone is right behind us, they are ready to catch us if we fall. When the risen Jesus began to speak to Mary, he asked her, why are you crying and who are you looking for? He didn't ask that question because he was dispassionate or uncaring. On the contrary, he asked that question because he wanted Mary to vocalise what was happening within her. Because as a good doctor, Jesus knew that grief that is bottled up and not expressed can actually cause a lot of physical and emotional and mental discomfort and harm. At first, Mary didn't know it was Jesus speaking to her. Even though she turned round, it says in verse 14, she didn't realise it was him. So once again, she was confused in what she was seeing. When she looked at the stone rolled away from the tomb, she didn't see resurrection. She saw desecration because she believed someone had stolen the body. When she looked at the person standing behind her, she didn't see the risen Jesus. She thought she was looking at the gardener and asked if he had been the one who had taken away the body of Jesus, and if so, to tell her where he had put it. In two ways, therefore, Mary was looking at evidence of the resurrection, an empty tomb and a risen body. But on both occasions, she missed out on the joy of the resurrection. And yet during it all, Jesus was alive. She just didn't know it. And right now, If you are on your own, then you are vulnerable, not only because of the virus and the sense of isolation that you may be feeling, but also because all kinds of thoughts can be going round in your mind, all kinds of fears and worries and anxieties. And because you don't always have someone around you to discuss your thoughts with and process them with you, then you can easily come to wrong conclusions and understandings about the current climate and maybe about where God is in all of this. Can I encourage you that if you're on your own today to grasp hold of the idea that the risen Jesus is right there with you. He hasn't left you, he hasn't forsaken you, but is standing with you ready to listen to your concerns. So share them with him. For Mary, the thing that made all the difference 
The thing that suddenly brought her revelation of the Lord's presence is revealed in verse 16, where it says, Jesus said to her, Mary. Jesus called her by her name. And then everything became personal. The risen Jesus became personal. Her eyes were opened. Suddenly she could see things in a totally different way. Now she realised that the tomb was empty, not because someone had taken Jesus' body, but because Jesus had risen from the dead. Now she realised that she was not talking to the gardener, but talking to the risen Jesus. She heard Jesus call her name and she experienced a revelation of the resurrection and it changed her life. Oh, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. She moved from the grief of the crucifixion to the joy of the resurrection. And what made the difference was when she became aware that the risen Jesus was right there with her. When the resurrection became personal, it became meaningful. At the start of the day, Jesus did that for one person, Mary. But at the end of the day, Jesus did a similar thing for a group of people, his disciples, who were all meeting in one place. And maybe this year, in this very unusual Easter season, for the first time for many of us, we may be able to really identify with how the disciples were feeling on the night of that first resurrection day. Because it says that they were gathered together in a self-imposed lockdown. It says in verse 19 of John chapter 20 that the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. They'd locked themselves in. They were afraid of what was going on outside the door. Jesus had been crucified a couple of days earlier and all of the disciples had run away out of fear for their own lives. And they were concerned that the same authorities who had taken Jesus away and killed him may be after them next. So they put themselves into lockdown. Now remember, all the time that they were full of fear in lockdown, Jesus was alive. They just didn't know it. In our reading, it tells us that Peter and John had seen the empty tomb in the morning. But that doesn't mean that they thought Jesus was alive. It says in verse 8 of our reading, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So they were very similar to Mary. They had seen the empty tomb and believed that it was empty. But they hadn't connected it with Jesus being alive. So on that first resurrection day, they were still living in the grief of the crucifixion rather than living in the joy of the resurrection. And as a result, they put themselves into lockdown. As you look around the room you're in now, at the four walls and maybe the windows out into the world, you are in a relatively safe place. The walls that are surrounding you whilst at times you might think are enclosing you and maybe imprisoning you, are in fact also protecting you. And that's how the disciples were feeling on the night of that first resurrection day. They were thinking, we need to be in this room. We need to be in a place of safety because there's danger outside. We mustn't associate with people outside because to do so will bring danger to our lives. We must stay indoors. For us, the danger of coronavirus isn't going to come knocking on the door, unless of course it's a person who's infected that is doing the knocking. But for the disciples, there would have been the real threat that at any moment the authorities could have come bursting through that door and arrested them all. What is interesting is that verse 19 starts with this image of the disciples in lockdown, but it ends with something very significant and wonderful happening in that place of lockdown. For after saying that the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, it then says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When Mary was grieving at the tomb, Jesus was standing right there with her. And when the disciples were fearing in the room, Jesus was standing right there with them. At the tomb, And in the room, 
Jesus was present among them. And right there in that place of lockdown, Jesus offered them his peace, showed them his scars so that they knew it was him. And then in our reading in verse 20, it says, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They had moved from the grief of the crucifixion to the joy of the resurrection. Jesus said, peace be with you. The risen Jesus had become personal. They experienced a revelation of the resurrection and it changed their life. Oh, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. They moved from the grief of the crucifixion to the joy of the resurrection. And what made the difference was when they became aware that the risen Jesus was right there with them. When the resurrection became personal, it became meaningful. Today, on this very unusual Easter Sunday, we too can know the risen Lord right where we are. Whilst we may not see a physical Jesus, that doesn't mean he's not with us. On that first resurrection evening, the disciple Thomas wasn't present with the other disciples, but he was there the following week. And John's Gospel goes on to tell us that Jesus turned up again the following week, particularly for Thomas. And you may want to read the rest of chapter 20 today to read that part of the story. The significant thing about Jesus' encounter with Thomas was that Thomas needed to see Jesus alive in order for him to believe that he was. And Jesus said that actually that isn't the way that it's going to be. In the future, people will be called to believe in the risen Jesus without seeing him physically. And this is what Jesus says to Thomas in verse 29 of chapter 20. He says, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. And that's where we are today, for we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. It's not based on what we see, it's based on what we know by faith. And then through the eyes of faith, we start to see things differently. When Mary and the disciples saw Jesus, they began to see the world around them differently. And when we find personal faith in Jesus, we too will see things differently. We will see the Lord at work in places that we hadn't noticed before. We will find that we have a greater sense of hope in life because we understand that God is always in control. And we will have an inner peace because we will know that Jesus loves us and has forgiven us of our sin and that nothing can separate us from that love. And when that is the case, we can experience the joy of the resurrection, not just on Easter Sunday, but every day of our lives. Because Jesus is always alive and he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He is always with us. So today, while we're all encountering lockdown, let's seek after the joy of the resurrection. Whether you are someone who has never asked Jesus into your life or whether you are someone who has been a Christian for a long time. Let's take the letters of lockdown to remind us of how we may receive the joy of the resurrection in our homes today. The L of lockdown, listen to the story of Easter and let it become more personal to you this year. The first O of lockdown, open your mind to the truth that Jesus has died for you, taken upon himself the punishment for your sin and has risen from the dead so that death may no longer be the end for you but instead you may have eternal life because of him. The sea of lockdown. Confess your sin to the Lord and bring to him the things that trouble you today. The K of lockdown. Know that he will hear your prayer and will respond to it. The D of lockdown. Depend on the Lord to give you strength for the day. And if you're not yet a Christian, then the D stands for decide to ask Jesus to forgive you and save you and come into your life and then ask him to do exactly that. 
the second O of lockdown. Offer your life to Jesus and allow him to become the controlling influence within you today, this week and every week of your life. The W of lockdown. Wait on the Lord and allow him to fill you with his peace and with his Holy Spirit today, just as he did for the disciples on that first resurrection evening. And the N of lockdown. Nurture your faith in Jesus by praying, reading God's word and telling others of what Jesus has done for you. Acknowledging with gratitude his sacrifice for you on the cross and declaring that Jesus is alive and he is alive in you. And may we all experience the joy of the resurrection As we celebrate the truth declared in our final song, the stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrection king has rendered you defeated. Forever he is glorified. Forever he is lifted high. Forever he is risen. He is alive. Oh
And that brings us to the end of our Resurrection Day service. I hope you'll be able to join us again next week. In the meantime, stay safe, be wise, pray on and give thanks to the Lord in all circumstances. The Lord bless you. You've been listening to FBC Radio on 16.9.